interaction. We would now like to start the biotechnology session entitled Biotechnology in Future Urban Environmental Design, visualizing uh, or visualize microorganisms and invisible living things in the city. First, I would like to introduce the speakers. Dr. Christopher Mason, Associate Professor at Weill Cornell Medicine, Department of Physiology and Biophysics. Dr. Mari Miyamoto, a Business and Technical Application Manager at Oxford Nanopore Technologies Limited. Dr. Kazuharu Arakawa, Associate Professor at Keio University's Faculty of Environment and Info Studies, Institute for Advanced Biosciences. And Mr. Sebastian Kosioba, a molecular florist. Now, first, I would like to ask Dr. Mason for an, an introduction to this session. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and it's a, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to come speak, and especially Jun for uh, organi helping organize the session, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I will um, give a brief background uh, about what we will all be discussing today, and uh, of course, to repeat some of the languages, uh, I'm very honored to also uh, host uh, three really excellent scientists uh, here this morning. One of the things that we're going to talk about is the fact that uh, we are living at the end of a technological revolution that is the fastest revolution that has ever happened in human history. And so you can see here, it, moving faster than the speed of computational advancement, we can see the cost to sequence DNA has uh, been decreasing at a log scale over the past 15 years. This led to a lot of excitement when people thought we had the $1,000 genome three years ago, so you could use your own DNA sequencing for your health care. But just earlier this year, it was pr pr proposed that we would actually be very soon be much lower than that, so that we're on our way towards a $100 human genome. So you could actually sequence your DNA, you could sequence anyone's DNA, you could sequence anything. So for example, what if you wanted to sequence an entire city? You could now do so, which I'll talk about today. And one of my favorite parts of this study and other ones like it is that a lot of the DNA, when you sequence DNA in your chair, on your skin, in your shoes, uh, on average about half of it is unknown, has never been seen before, it represents a complete new discovery uh, of, the, of the DNA that's around us. And so this is not the first time in human history we have been faced with ha a half of a world being unknown. So when Magellan set sail, of course, this was the world as he knew it in 1450, and he was missing half of the world to go and discover it. So he was literally, uh, you know, essentially a half, more than halfway undone. And a similar uh, exploration happened when the microscope was invented. In 1673, we could suddenly observe a hidden invisible world for the first time. And so I would argue that today, Sequencers, like the ones we've studied and also Oxford Nanopore, which you'll hear a lot about today, uh, are really molecular microscopes that let us visualize uh, an invisible world that's all around us. So that's really my, my brief introduction. I think that's it. Uh, so now I'll just jump into the talk. So um, I want to tell you a bit about subterranean and subway and urban and also a little bit of interplanetary metagenomics. And I want to take you basically from the A, C, Gs, and Ts of the genetic code until eventually we can actually see what's life like a little bit uh, when you go above the Earth and see what might be beyond it. So one of the key questions that we're studying is we, as humans, are genomes that are preparing for very long trips. And we know what happens over time in cancer, for example. If you have normal cells, they can eventually get mutations and eventually sometimes uh, become cancerous. But one of the key questions about going, say, to faraway places like Mars is, you know, what else happens? We know that this happens, for example, in disease and in, in human health. But when you look at going to Mars, we have to think about all of the aspects of human biology, all the aspects of 
micro, the microbiology and all the technology that will be needed to understand uh, how we get to Mars. Uh, unfortunately here it looks like Mars is sucking all of the nutrients away from Earth. Uh, but that is not the plan. Uh, the plan is to have us on two planets, and not to take it away. Uh, this is just an artistic rendering. So the way we think about uh, what happens to the body on long-term space missions generally revolves around the central dogma of molecular biology, so DNA, RNA, protein. But we know that this is uh, incomplete as well. So we have been expanding what we view as sort of the standard uh, measures of biology by looking uh, first at the epigenome, which is the regulatory layer behind DNA that controls when DNA is turned on and turned off. And so here in black is the DNA, the genome, and in red are small chemical groups like methyl groups uh, that are the epigenome that can control uh, your genes. And this is very important on the very first day of your existence. So when you were an embryo, when egg and sperm came together, you have to reset these marks. And so you, you might remember this, when the egg and sperm came together, there was candles and soft music and flowers. Do you remember that, anyone? Oh, that's what I remember for my embryo uh, state. Uh, but when it comes together, egg and sperm, you have to reset all of these epigenetic marks. They go back down to blue. That means they get taken away. You take away all the methyl groups and you reset the epigenetic marks across the genome so that you can allow one cell to become all of the cell types in your body. This is the fundamental part of epigenetics. And so very clearly we have epigenome dynamics that occur uh, over time when you're an embryo. But what we've learned in only the last three years is that there are other dynamics at play. So we have seen, for example, that DNA methylation across all of your cells is ticking like a clock, uh, essentially a way, uh, much like a uh, clock on your wrist, across all tissues. It's been replicated by our group, uh, replicated by other groups. And this means that, for example, if we can tell the age of you with pretty good accuracy, if we take DNA that you leave on the chair or DNA left at the forum, we could actually sequence the DNA and tell how old you are. Just based on when you leave this room, we could uh, figure that out. So uh, we're not going to do that, uh, but we could do that. And this has interesting implications. So if you can sequence the DNA left behind on any chair and discern the age, uh, what if you have, you know, what if you got a fake ID? Uh, like at YoIDs.com, you can get a fake ID uh, overnight. Uh, yes, you can pay by Bitcoin. Uh, and that means that what if you go to the bar to try and get in? You could imagine someone saying, you know, you can't get in because your epigenetic age is not, is not up to 18, so you can't get into this bar, you know, maybe. Uh, this hasn't happened yet, but it could happen in the future. And so this is what we think about for the epigenome. But the other part of the biology on the human side I want to, uh, uh, that we look at is the transcriptome, or the RNA level of the central dogma. And what's interesting about this is uh, here as well, our discovery of how many genes are in the human genome has changed over time. So instead of there being just a st static number of genes, in the last 10 years we have discovered another 10,000 genes that are annotated and, and part of the human genome. And at this rate, if we think of the cities in 20 years from now, or going to Mars in 20 years from now, we might be back at around 100,000 genes uh, at this rate. So it's very interesting to think about the process of discovery is still ongoing, uh, even for the human genome. And then one last part is to note that the epitranscriptome is a very new field that we also look at, which is the regulatory layer behind RNA, much like you have the epigenome behind DNA. And so here, also, you can have small chemical marks onto RNA that also hold the, some of the same modifications like 6-methyladenine, and uh, this is now a new field that's coming into focus. I just want to mention it here. But when you look at all of this together, uh, this is how we think of the central dogma of bi biology today, is that it is, some people think, much more complicated, but I think this is much more beautiful and much more uh, complex, uh, but probably more accurate. And when we think about the body going to Mars, we have to keep all of these uh, levers of biology uh, in our mind. So that's uh, the, the human cells. You know, in every human cell, there's these regulatory layers. But there are, of course, many other cells. There are, of course, uh, the others. Uh, 
So uh, if you look at your cells, this is your human cells. You have many, many bacterial cells on you, in you, and around you. Uh, and if you look at the, the cellular democracy uh, of, your, of your body, your human cells are a minority party. So you are outnumbered by those bacteria. Uh, you would never win the election. You would always just do what they tell you to do. Uh, because you're outnumbered, some people think two times or sometimes maybe ten times the number of bacterial cells, but you're definitely outnumbered uh, by those uh, bacteria. And they add a large amount of mass. Several pounds of your body are bacteria, or maybe one kilogram if you step onto a scale. And each part of your body is colonized by a miniature ecosystem called the microbiome. This has led to a lot of exciting research about how it Im impl implicates obesity or inflammatory bowel disease, or now over a dozen different diseases have been implicated uh, by Im the microbiome. And what's also exciting is they have really surprising places that they turn up. So for example, they show up inside of a tumor and actually defend the tumor against the, the treatment. So they can actually, the bacteria can be the reason that your, th your cancer therapy didn't work. So you have to first take antibiotics and then take chemotherapy for it to work in this case. Also, in some cases, they can make uh, molecules that control your cells. Uh, and in other cases, uh, they can actually work on your behalf. So you don't have to ask them to, they will just work for you anyway. In this case, this is the, an instance of them making uh, antibiotic. This is from a normal, normal vaginal flora making a defensive antibiotic to protect it against other invading bacteria, uh, which means essentially this molecule is serving as a bacterial microbiome vaginal force field. Uh, which is defending you against other invading bacteria. That's not a medical term, that's just something is what's happening. Um, so that's part of the, the superpowers of the microbiome, the ability to process drugs to defend you. But when you talk about bacteria in a city, most people think about this. They don't want to touch a surface, they're terrified of any railing that might have bacteria. The funny thing about this is the holes of the paper towel are bigger than the bacterial cells. So the, the, the paper towel doesn't even do anything in this case. But I did see one woman, she got a latex glove, so she was ready. She was really prepared to defend herself. So I became interested in the subway and its microbiome. Uh, one, because we always had DNA that didn't map to the human genome. So I wondered what it was. The second reason is that I watched my daughter, when she got old enough to ride the subway, grab the subway pole, sometimes uh, lick the subway pole, put things in her mouth. I became very curious about what is actually there. And there was nothing in the literature about what's present on the surfaces that are touched by millions of people every day in New York City and billions around the world. So we started to explore. When, when confronted with ignorance, the best thing to do is experimentation and a discovery. So we started to swab many places around the city to see what we could find to build a city-scale metagenome profile, or what's been called uh, the metropolome by the New Yorker. So when we published this two years ago, this was the first genetic map of a city, which was created by having people go out and swab. You can see here, uh, for about three minutes, enter the data. It was time-stamped and geotagged. And then we could actually take these samples extract the DNA here, these sequence reads, map them to known genomes, if we could find known genomes, and then quantify them, see where, how many there are in which places. And this actually led us to see that, again, about half the DNA was unknown, un under our fingertips, of uh, mysterious DNA, things that we had never seen before. And, uh, but some of the things we had seen before, like Pseudomonas petita, in this case is actually a very beneficial bacteria that can even absorb toxins. We also found uh, that the, you can go to this map and browse it as well. And we also found that the subway looks a lot like skin bacteria, which makes sense because that's what's touching the surfaces. And we also saw that at most, there are about 15,000 species that could be on the subway. This is now on parts of New York City on the street. You can see it's called a New York City Fact, number seven. And you can also go to the Pratt Art Museum and browse the data if you want. It's on exhibit right now uh, at the museum. So one of my other favorite part of the data is we could also observe molecular echoes or things that had been left behind. 
In particular, in some areas of the, of the city, we could see very unique signatures that were uh, only present at this one station. And we could actually see that this was because th this station was flooded by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, it was very, uh, basically submerged underwater uh, after the hurricane. And so we wanted to see, was this a molecular echo of it being under the ocean? And indeed, we could see species that were previously found in Antarctic cold waters that were present uh, on the walls of the subway station that here actually make a very useful uh, eco eicosapentaenoic acid, uh, which is often found in fish, on fish or in fish when you are eating them, and could even decrease your risk of suicide. So here is a good microbe that if you did lick a subway pole, uh, which I don't necessarily recommend, uh, but if you did, if you have a daughter, you could be getting sometimes very good bacteria when you do so. And so, uh, out of the 10 parts, the other thing that this really inspired us to do is think, well, this was New York City, but what if we built up a global context? And so what if we had a snapshot of genetic cities, and not just in New York, but all the cities, uh, other cities around the world? And this, uh, with many collaborators, uh, including Haru Suzuki, Dr. Suzuki's here, is to start to build these metagenomic maps around the world and also use it to track antibiotic resistance and to use this as an engine for discovery of what's around us. And so... So far, we have 75 cities. You can see New York City is only number seven on the list of, of busiest cities. It has 1.7 billion riders. But, you know, Tokyo actually has more riders, and so we've been swabbing Tokyo with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what we've collected so far is about thir over 13,000 samples uh, from around the world by swabbing in them. And, and one day a year, uh, you know, imagine if you could swab the whole planet in one day that's kind of what we do with what's called Global City Sampling Day. So as people wake up past the international date line, you can see they start to wake up and we get collections and swabs. So it's like taking one big nylon swab across the whole planet, and in a coordinated fashion, we all collect samples on the same day uh, as a team. And it's a really integrated international team called Global City Sampling Day, and build up these maps uh, across the globe. And what we've seen so far is actually that uh, each city does have a unique antibiotic profile that sometimes is very distinct from other cities. Some cities have as much as five or ten times the number of antibiotic resistance markers. Uh, I won't tell you which ones yet, uh, but we uh, see very large differences between the cities uh, in some cases. And the other thing is that this data has been useful for us, but also has been useful uh, to build up, uh, expand the tree of life. So this was recently used to expand by three times the size of the tree of life for all known microbial organisms. And so I think maybe for the Innovative Cities Forum, we should actually have a ranking of which city has the most unique genes, which city has the most interesting and complex biology that lets you discover new genes. And so we could add this to the ranking, maybe come in a different color. Uh, and so this is one uh, idea. But the other thing we, we've just finished last summer, and uh, actually the last samples uh, last week finished collection post-Olympics, was before, during, and after the Olympics, is what happens to a city when millions of people converge on it. So we just finished the collection in Rio, and we, I, I would uh, hope that all of us, some of you might contribute in Tokyo to do the same experiment and see what happens to the city during such an event. And so that's one plan about making it bigger, but could it be done faster? Could we do this metagenome sequencing faster? You'll hear about nanopore sequencing, which is one way to do it. But we did an experiment at a meeting earlier this year to see could we swab everyone's phones when they get to the meeting and then sequence it and tell them what's on their telephones. And I think we should do this next year at Innovative Cities Forum, if you ask me. But we set up a little booth and swabbed everyone's uh, phone, brought them back to the lab, the Illumina lab, and actually extracted, prepped, and sequenced. Uh, they didn't sleep all night, so they had the state of to do it in 36 hours. And then we quickly did the analysis, and actually what we could see is, can your phone reveal what you've been doing or what you've been eating? And so we sequenced 96 samples. We found one person had 94% unknown DNA, maybe an alien, was attending the conference, we don't know. A lot of people had bacteria or unknown or uh, archaea or viral DNA, a lot of human DNA you can see as well. But then we saw some interesting trends. This was a lot of Apple DNA, this was mine, I was a control, I put Apple on my phone and it was it found it again. We also found uh, Scott had recently spilled a bag of chips on his phone, so he looked a lot like corn. 
This woman had eaten a salad. This woman had a lot of cow DNA, but she had a brand new leather purse that was shedding cow DNA on her phone. And this person we thought looked like he had an orange, so I emailed him and said, hey, did you just have an orange or orange juice? And he said, yeah, I just peeled and ate a navel orange, and we predicted it based on his phone. And this person, uh, Sridhar, said, you know, you have a lot of pig on your phone. Is it pork or bacon? And then he said, yeah, actually, I used the phone to take a picture of my sandwich after he ate his pork sandwich. So you could actually see that it's still left on his phone. Then we also looked at samples. Do they look like skin or airways? Most of them look like skin, which you would expect. And we also could predict that who, who had dogs. So we asked, do you have a dog? And these are the people that had dogs, and the matches did the dog genome versus those who didn't. So we actually got very accurate measurement of just do you have a dog? We can tell based on the DNA on your phone. And then also we could see who was likely to have antibiotics. So this is doing things faster, but could we do it uh, farther is also the next goal. Can we not just do it here faster, but could we do it in space is kind of the last two, two points of my talk is doing this actually not just on Earth, but doing this for an interplanetary context. And so we've been working uh, with NASA on uh, what's called the NASA twi twin study, so two identical twins. And the first thing that NASA likes to do when you start a project is they need to give you a patch. So we had the patch that was made, and you can see the study here. Scott Kelly launched into space in, in 2015 and went up there for a year, and we wanted to see what happened to his body when he, was, when he had this view for a full year. So we measured everything I've just told you about this morning. So we looked at DNA, we looked at epigenetics, we looked at RNA, proteins, looked at chromatin, antibodies, the immune system, telomeres, uh, small molecules, the microbiome, and all these measures over the course of two years. So six months before the flight, one year in space, and then six months when he came back. And so all of these molecular measures built us a portrait of what happens to him in space. We got some samples that were frozen, but we also had some samples with the Wakata protocol that were what are called live blood draws or ambient return. So here you can see drawing blood in space uh, is hard because the, the uh, tube doesn't stay in place. You can see it floating around right there. Uh, but you can see they actually do get it to work well, and actually not just with one tube, but you can actually draw blood uh, and actually pull out, in many cases, many tubes, and actually does work well in zero gravity because the pressure in your body can actually push it right out. And so we got some blood draws that basically put back through the atmosphere, through the clouds, and some of them came back, and this is a picture of some of our samples coming back from Kazakhstan, and the retro thrusters uh, landing it there in Kazakhstan. So we got the samples back and actually got live blood cells from space and then characterized them. One of the really surprising things we found so far is that instead of actually getting your telomeres getting shorter in space, we've actually seen that in, the, in space they actually got longer uh, than what we've seen here on Earth. And for reasons we don't yet know why, but we know that the telomere biology changes a lot and a lot of genes change their expression. And so this means that space uh, kind of made Scott Kelly a little bit taller and a little bit younger, uh, but not that much. And once he came back to Earth, it went away. So it's not permanent. Um, so uh, the last point I want to th think about is, like, can we actually, what if we could just sequence in space? Instead of bringing everything back here, it's a very difficult. Could we just sequence in space and use a nanopore to do it? So, of course, NASA, the first thing they need to do is give us a patch. So we got a patch again. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, biomolecular sequencer project in collaboration with Oxford Nanopore. And we did test this first to see if it would work in zero gravity. This is something called the parabolic flight simulator, or the vomit comet. And you can see here what happens when you actually try to do some pipetting uh, in zero gravity. Is it does the plane starts to go in zero g? You'll actually see the, all the tips float away. So if you've done pipetting, you know this is very difficult. And eventually, as the plane keeps going, you stay in zero gravity. You will keep moving, and uh, tips will keep flying around and it's very difficult. Um, and eventually then you get to the bottom of the parabolic flight and everything comes back down. So this is Andy Feinberg, a friend and colleague. And we did get it to work. We loaded them on the, the flow cell uh, and it actually passes the first test. So it did work and we published this last year so that uh, nanopores were ready for liftoff. So then last summer, uh, astronaut Rubens went up. She learned how to load a flow cell, made her way up to the space station uh, we were sent up resupply mission, and then this is last summer, the first time us trying to do sequencing in zero gravity. And NASA added that music. That was not me. They, they liked it. And for dramatic effect. And so it actually worked. So last summer, we showed for the first time that you can actually sequence DNA in space and characterize what's present. Uh, and it was sort of the dawn of genomics in space. And we can see that Kate Rubin sequenced over a billion bases total, 
And we could even see using an algorithm we developed epigenetics in the pore data as well, where we can actually see modified bases present uh, uh, in the nanopore data. So this represents, this paper's in review now, and here's the preprint, the first genome sequence and assembled from data that was not made on this planet, uh, it was around the planet, and also the first base epigenome. So I want to close uh, in the last couple minutes about looking ahead, which we'll hear a lot about today, about thinking about designer genomics, which I'm on the advisory board for a project called the Genome Project Right, which is to think about how we actually design genomes, which I think is the natural step uh, of uh, the science. And so I would even th I argue that how well you understand biology can be measured by how well you can predict the outcome from your engineering. So could we engineer the space station microbiome? Could we avoid this kind of surface on the space station, which we already can do for human skin, you can replace your skin microbiome if you want uh, already. We know this is possible. You can read about it here. But, you know, what about modifying the human genome? Should we uh, modify the human genome? It's not could we. We already can. It's been done. But should we and how? And I think if you do no harm from a medical perspective, sometimes that requires action. So the National Academy of Sciences recently put out re uh, recommendations that agree, saying that in some cases you should be able to repair a genetic defect so you can have a healthy life. And this, this includes cases like uh, a heart defect, where you could actually repair the damaged gene, uh, or if you have an infertile couple, or I think you know, a third instance where you might want to engineer the genome and have genetic defenses and basically prepare the DNA for living in, say, dangerous locations would be uh, an astronaut. So, for example, if you send someone to Mars to live there, you would want to give them all of the defenses you possibly could, including genetic defenses. So potentially uh, using extra copies of genes like P53 to build up the defenses or to repair the epigenetic changes when someone comes back or is changing on Mars. Or uh, one last idea is that you could actually give them maybe photosynthetic skin. And so I recently did a calculation to see how much skin would we need to actually have uh, green skin, you would need about something the size of two tennis courts of skin to get enough energy from the sun. So uh, you wouldn't look that good, but you, you could, in theory, do it uh, by my calculation. And uh, also looking ahead is when we start sending the rovers to Mars in 2020, we have to think about what we're sending there for what microbes are passengers on that robot. And so uh, the, in closing thought is when you look ahead, uh, I think about going to Mars and sending people there and using the technology to go there. Uh, it seems like it's far away. It seems like it's a crazy idea. Uh, but you know, monitoring an entire planet and, and mitigating the effects of, say, climate change and engineering a whole planet is something that we already do on Earth. And so going to Mars is just the second planet that we will do this to, not the first. And so this is exciting to think about for uh, the scale of the project and the scope. But then also, it's not really that far away. Uh, and in each one of your cells is several meters of DNA. And if you stack it all up uh, on end to end, you could actually get enough uh, distance to go to Mars uh, just from the DNA in your cells in your body with 1% of your cells. So in closing, uh, you know, we need more uh, longitudinal monitored astronauts. We now know we can sequence in zero gravity and in space. And for the next four years, we just got some grants that were for any new infection on the space station, we'll be able to sequence the, the, the bacteria and actually analyze the data and do diagnostics on the space station. So I want to thank everyone in the lab who makes this work very possible. I want to thank Scott Kelly, who uh, li literally gave blood, sweat, and tears to this. And you can see this is the official NASA poster. Here is the, uh, the, death, the death Star they snuck in the background. And also collaborators at the Consortium for Space Genetics, uh, MIT Media Lab, and Kevin Slavin, who's now uh, leaving to go to the shed, as well as collaborators at JPL, UCSF uh, funding, of course, from NASA and Pershing and other foundations, and everyone from lab. And thank you very much, and we'll uh, thank you for your attention. And then we'll save questions for the end. We're going to go through the, the other three talks, and we'll have a Q&A uh, at the end uh, of the session. So actually, I forget uh, who's now here next, right? Yeah, yes, great. Uh, thank you. Right, right. I'll just close this. Next, we have Dr. Mari Miyamoto.
うまくいったんですけどどうしてもらっていいですか。いつも立ち上げたままになってる。はい、えー、大変お待たせいたします。Thank you very much for waiting. I'm from Oxford Nanopore Technologies and I'm a manager. My name is Mari Miyamoto and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.、Uh, we just heard from Chris about a very interesting、uh, topic and he talked about a very small sequencer that could be used in outer space as well.、Uh, we, I would like you to know a bit more about it, so I'd like to make this presentation. So, first about Oxford Nanopore. From、um, its foundation, we have been trying to create a tool that、uh, will enable the analysis of any living thing by any person in any environment. So, we started with something for RD, and now this product is being used in many different companies、um, in the area of education, in universities and high school labs. And also among citizen scientists. And now we are making more small,、uh, much smaller products,、uh, which is being used in bio defense as well as in the healthcare area. So, Oxford Nanopore is a company. With its headquarters in Oxford in the UK.、Uh, we have about 300 people working around the world, and 250 of them are in RD. So it's been about 15 years since、um, its foundation, and last year we were able to commercialize our product. And it, we now have an office here in Japan as well. So, first,、uh, nanopore.、Uh, I think you can understand from the name nano.、Um, this is a very small、uh, product、uh, to sequence DNA. So, I'd like to explain how it works.、Uh, this membrane part. This membrane,、uh, and you have this nanopore injected in. And when、um, a A molecule passes by, there is a current that occurs, and we try to measure that、uh, to see how the current changes. So, the DNA,、uh, as it passes through this hole,、uh, we get the raw data uh, which uh, forms this wave. And using this and also deep learning,、uh, the AGTC.、Uh, Transformation is、uh, observed, and the main point is that the molecules are being observed.、Uh, it's unlike the other DNA sequencers.、Uh, you usually look at the markers on DNA, but now we are directly looking at the DNA itself, the DNA molecules themselves. 
So as Chris explained earlier, the epigenetics, uh, we are able to directly see uh, the epigenetics, and that's the big characteristic of, of this new device. Now, let's say um, a molecule passes through this hole, we can measure this. We're not just waiting for something to pass through. Uh, we want to have uh, some uh, motor protein to control the speed of the molecule passing by. And we want to observe it at a steady speed to look at the DNA strand. So in our R&D, we are not just focusing on the nanopore, but the membrane uh, protein, and we are looking at the other conditions so that we can uh, use that knowledge to make products. And so the nanopores individually will be controlled and the waves uh, that are captured when measuring the current uh, will be controlled individually. So just a little bit about the DNA sequencing. So you have a sample, and as Chris said, DNA could be found anywhere, uh, microorganisms as well. Um, we also have DNA, so there are living things everywhere which all have DNA and genome. Um, that is extracted. It will be prepared so that it passes through the nanopore hole, and then the current uh, will be transferred into the uh, TCAG codes and then uh, the analysis will take place. And this is Minayan. Uh, I think you've seen this and the video and the photograph. It's a very small compact size. It's, uh, it can be held in one hand. So, if you order this, this will be delivered through FedEx, and this is the Minayan itself, and within it you have this consumables, the flow cell, and the prepared sample will be applied here, and the DNA sequencing will start. Uh, we have the USB cable, you can connect it to your computer, and from the computer side you can control the sequencing. A DNA sequencing in the past uh, required us a, an a expert to set things up. However, our d sequencer could be utilized uh, the moment it is delivered. You can set it up yourselves and use it. So just like this, uh, everything could be controlled on your PC. The DNA sequencer uh, that when we started our development, we were only able to get a small amount of data from genome, 300 mega. So a human genome is 3 g giga, so it's a very, a very small amount. But that was back in 2014. But now, 16 gigabyte uh, was reached, so we now can get a large amount of data with just one run. And the development, of course, um, the accuracy has to go up uh, compared to 2014 when it was first commercialized. Uh, it's going up. And starting last year, we have seen a great uh, dynamic um, improvements and the throughput also. The, how much sequence could be read in just one run? This is also being improved greatly. And our customers, uh, according to what they posted on uh, Twitter, uh, this is the throughput that they were able to gain. Now, data quality, because this is a very small sequencer, uh, which was first uh, commercialized in 2014, 2015, we thought it was really amazing. Uh, I believe you will not uh, have a chance to see DNA sequencers, because DNA sequencers are being used by a handful of people. It's a very large um, refrigerator size equipment, usually. But now we have this very small compact sequencer, so everybody was really uh, focusing on this. But the accuracy was low, and the data amount captured was rather small and people thought that it would take time. But as development uh, went on, Nanopore, uh, first the base collar uh, was used to, to get the 
TCAG uh, data. Now we are getting more accurate data. And in the latest version, the motor protein is used to control the speed of the protein as it, excuse me, the molecules as it passes through the hole. And now the throughput has um, improved greatly. Now the data analysis part. So you connect it to the uh, computer and the, t uh, the wave uh, will be turned into the TCAG data and uh, you can prepare and set up the environment to look at many different things. One of uh, the characteristic is that we can capture data on a real-time basis. Uh, these this graph uh, will come out on a real-time basis, and this is looking at um, bacteria, uh, to identify the species of the bacteria on a real-time basis, especially uh, when you are trying to understand what uh, bacteria you are tackling. Is it influenza or if it, is it salmonella? Uh, can you apply some medicine on it or not? Uh, you can capture that information immediately so that the doctor can understand what medicine should be applied to the patient. So that's the merit of being able to carry out real-time analysis. And recently, uh, bacteria is becoming uh, resistant to antimicrobial agents. I believe you are inoculated for influenza, but the influenza bacteria also is getting stronger against these um, vaccines. So you need to know if the bacteria is resistant or not when you decide on what antibiotic you will use or what medicine you will use. and. We are providing a platform in order for you to understand that. Now, the direct RNA. Uh, Chris used a slide to explain this a little bit, um, the g genome information. Um, and you have the RNA, and then, then you have the protein. And within your body, um, you have protein and the cells that make your hair, for example. You, uh, there is the RNA for that. And so it is very important to understand what RNA you are looking at to understand the function. So in the past, RNA. Uh, was very difficult to capture because RNA is not really stable and it's a single strand. But with our technology, we can read the molecules directly. And so with this kit, the RNA molecule itself could be read in. So the RNA, uh, just like DNA, uh, could be modified and the expression will change because of the modification. So RNA and DNA uh, had to be changed to cDNA, and sometimes we miss information through that. But uh, now we can directly see RNA with this kit. And the funders founder wanted this uh, to be used by anybody. If it's too expensive, nobody will be able to buy it. It should be priced so that everybody can buy it. So we have the starter pack. And if you get the starter pack, you get the consumables and then the equipment itself and then the reagent. Uh, it's uh, just uh, $1,000 with all of this. And so the pricing, uh, which makes it uh, very accessible to anybody, uh, we will be able to have many scientists utilize this and students will also be able to utilize this. And just yesterday, I went to see some students, uh, what kind of samples will be, could be used to make things interesting. We went to speak to university students. So uh, we have this RNA starter pack as well, just like the DNA starter pack. Now this handheld sequencer, Minayan, what can we do? So it's a small DNA sequencer. You might think that the only small things could be possible, but already human genome could be uh, analyzed with this uh, small equipment, with this small DNA se sequencer. Of course, we'll, you will be using a lot of um, the consumables. However, already we are seeing this happening. The black and gray part uh, is uh, what could be connected through using the Minayan data. So you can see uh, how much has been covered by Minayan and also plants, the tomatoes uh, genome. I believe Sebastian will talk about this, but plant uh, genome has not been 
analyzed fully yet. Uh, there are Christmas tree genome or lettuce genomes, which is much larger than the human genome. And it's very difficult to capture at this. But what we, but these are things that we eat on a daily basis: tomato, plants, uh, what goes into our mouth. We want to understand the genome so that uh, we might be able to make uh, species that are stronger uh, against d diseases, or that uh, we can grow them in any kind of environment. Understanding the genome is very important for that. And um, infectious disease. Already, there's a paper out on this. Tuberculosis could be identified in just one day. And there are different ways to identify this, but it took more than a day in the past. Um, and this is comparing uh, past uh, equipment that our company has made. Uh, now we get the same day diagnostic. Uh, now uh, the bacteria uh, could be um, identified in just one day. Uh, this is the case of Arabidopsis genome assembly and uh, comparing the RNA data, uh, and um, already we have seen as more than a 0 0.9 a correlation with past data that has been captured. Now we want to have diagnostic uh, being done speedily. So this is for a brain tumor, um, and this shows that the genome information in the genomics um, information is um, making possible the same day diagnostics. Now this very small uh, DNA sequencer, it's very handy, it's very usable, but if you are handling large amounts of genome. Uh, using the same chemistry, we are providing a bigger a sequencer. So Minayan, um, you can capture 10 gigabyte of data, but this one it can give you 50 gigabytes. Uh, you have 48 of them aligned together. And this is a mid-sized equipment. Uh, we also are selling this. Uh, and we will be delivering uh, this in Japan shortly. Now, other than these sequencers, uh, we also are developing other products. Uh, this is Voltrax uh, for the preparation of DNA before it is put into the sequencer. Uh, why do we need these things? When you use our kits, uh, the pre-processing will take about 10 minutes, but if you are sequencing out in the field, for example, if you're out in space, or if you are somewhere in the middle of Africa, or in Indonesia, uh, and you want to sequence the DNA, uh, you want to make the pre-preparation part very um, simple, and this is also a handheld type, but this is very small and compact. And um, also data analysis, uh, we wanted to provide a product that makes it uh, easier to do. Um, the wave form will be transferred into the AGTA form, and you need to have a large calculation capacity. Um, so we have this FPGA board uh, to take the base call um, waveform so that it could be transferred into the TCAG kind of data. And in order to reduce the running cost, uh, we now have this new type of flow cell. And this is even a smaller equipment. Uh, you can attach this to your cell phone and in the same way uh, using this very small uh, flow cell. And you can use uh, several nanopores in a row, but uh, this is very handy. You can take it to, out to the field. So anybody can take samples uh, and take DNA. And you can see it on your cell phone app. Cell phone app. So the founders wanted uh, to make it possible to sequence DNA anytime and anywhere by anybody, and it's already happening. As you've seen in Chris's presentation, out in space, DNA sequencer Minion has been used. Uh, the indigo V, B, uh, all kinds of equipments were taken, uh, and sequencing is happening around the world. And here, this is um, Africa when the Ebola virus broke out, uh, and 
because this is a very dangerous disease, you don't want to trans, uh, transport uh, the DNA anywhere. You can take, you can get the equipment to the field. And this is NASA, and this is an area. Uh, in the Arctic uh, area to see what kind of bacteria could be found. Uh, this is Antarctica, and already a paper has come out of this, and this is the Z Zika virus surveillance in Brazil. Um, on, uh, the scientists took all the equipment on a van and drove around Brazil, and this is in uh, Amazon. Uh, it is. This is a scientist trying to identify the species of a frog. So uh, this equipment could be used anytime, anywhere. And already uh, this is happening. So DNA sequencer, uh, now we have this very small version and it's now becoming ubiquitous. What are we trying to do? You might be wondering. But with, if you look at the computer development, computer in the past was very large, only special people were able to use it. It was a special equipment. But nowadays it could be used by anybody. Almost everybody will have their own um, computer. And now uh, our mobile phones are almost like a personal computer. And now we have these wearable sensors where you can use this and read email. And I believe the sequencers are following the same kind of path. Uh, it used to be very large. Nobody actually saw it uh, expect, unless you were a specialist. But nowadays, it's becoming smaller. Um, anybody can carry it around. And now you might be able to wear the equipment so that you can go anywhere and uh, analyze DNA samples when the need arises. And I understand there are people from different fields. Uh, and you are utilizing technology in all kinds of uh, fields uh, and creating um, new uh, value. So I do hope that our equipment will be useful. And uh, with this, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll again hold the questions uh, for the Q&A session at the end. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have Dr. Arakawa uh, come to the stage and uh, give an update on some cool spider silk. And I agree, I think in the future, maybe if you see a, a strange insect in your backyard or you see something weird in the, in the cafeteria, you can just sequence it and you'll, you'll know what it is, I think. Uh, Dr. Uh, Arakawa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arakawa from Keiwa University. Thank you very much. Uh, usually, I'm operating, uh, working in uh, Teruoka City in Yamagata. Now, every time I come to Roppongi Hills, I get excited because the building itself uh, and this uh, landscape is very uh, modern. It's very close to what we imagined as a future city when we were growing up. So I get very excited. Another thing that excites me is this. As you come into the building, uh, I see something that is a target of my research. I'm sure you looked at this as well. Uh, this is uh, the uh, spider object uh, by Louis Bourgeois. I understand that some people don't like it at all, but I think it's, it has great impact. Uh, and uh, the fact that you have this uh, in front of a super modern architecture, I think it's a combination of what's organic and inorganic. I don't know what the message is, but this is a symbol of Roppongi Hills. Great object in my mind. And I'll be talking about spider today. Now, changing gears, looking at Japan's uh, uh, science and technology policy. Uh, this is from Kei Dong Ren. Uh, this is the fifth science and technology basic plan, the very basics for Japan and the world to move forward in the area of science and technology. When the government is addressed this, this is the roadmap they have in mind. When we look at the development of humankind, uh, mankind, uh, we were hunter-gatherers a long time ago back then. Uh, we were gathering things around us. And then we moved into the agrarian society, and we would uh, settle, do farming, and were able to develop society. And centuries later, 
in the industrial society after the industrial revolution uh, we were able to control utilize machines use lots of energy as well so lots of social impact and then we are in the midst of information society with computers and other communication technologies some of the intelligence uh, has developed as well so the social framework has changed it's more global so what comes next as we move into the next step as mankind what needs to be done is the basic uh, thrust of this plan through ai others we are to go into a super smart society is being envisioned one thing that we have to consider is what are the driving forces of these changes i think Materials are important when you look at these evolution. There have been material changes in the societal changes. Uh, we were using stones, animal bones, uh, and then when we moved to, to the agrarian society, bronze played a pivotal role. The uh, farming tools were made from iron, bronze, which allowed humans to uh, farm more efficiently. And in the industrial revolution, industrial society, of course, uh, steam, locomotives, uh, use of coal, the energy were important. But uh, another important thing is uh, that at the early part of 18th century, steel technology grew. That was a driver. Of course, in this information society, semiconductors, ceramics are playing a pivotal role as drivers. So, for the next societal revolution, we need new materials. What would those be, is the question. At the same time, uh, as we evolved, we have been using resources. Population is growing. So what about sustainability? Uh, energy is often focused. Uh, oil is going to peak out, depleted. As you all know, we need alternative energy for that. Uh, solar, wind, and uh, other renewable energies. But before that, before talking about energy, uh, materials might be depleted earlier. For example, uh, indium, zinc, silver, these are going to be depleted before the energy sources are depleted, which means that for the stable development going forward, we need new materials which are renewable and sustainable. And one solution that we are proposing is spider silk. Spider silk very interesting properties very strong four times stronger than steel which might be counterintuitive uh, when you're walking around and I think you uh, went into the uh, or you ran into the uh, spider uh, web and uh, you were able to uh, remove it with a swing of a hand uh, but uh, steel uh, string, uh, one millimeter. Now, a spider silk is about 10 micron in diameter. Uh, so if the steel is a 10 micron, I think you can be, you can uh, cut it very uh, easily. And therefore, in terms of uh, density, it's very strong and it's very elastic, more elastic than nylon. So it is strong and elastic. Uh, we have yet to see such materials. So in the physics world, we call this toughness. And uh, toughness, in terms of toughness, spider skill excels, uh, something that we have never seen before. And it has thermal stability. Uh, it's made of protein. So it's uh, renewable, biorenewable. Now, in the history of mankind, when we look at all the materials that we have used, uh, it all falls into this chart, strength and extensibility, steel, carbon fiber, aramid fiber, uh, these are very strong, a uh, kipper fiber used for the bulletproof vest, very strong, but it won't extend 
So uh, they are represented in this blue area. Now, what we use for a clothes like uh, synthetic rubber or a nylon, it extends, but it's not strong. So they are represented in this red area. So we have this wide area in between that has yet to be filled, which is highly tough. And uh, spider silk falls into this category. Since it is tough, it has high strength and high extensibility. And we need to pursue materials that fall under this line. Now, this is a simulation. Let's say we have one centimeter diameter uh, spider uh, silk extended 500 meters that can catch the jumbo jet uh, if it's made of steel it would not uh, uh, it's not flexible so it would either collapse or uh, the uh, walls to which these uh, webs are connected to would collapse uh, with nylon uh, it is flexible uh, but uh, it's not strong enough so this jumbo jet will go through so this is the actual example, spider silk, carbon fiber, polyester, and synthetic spider silk. Polyester, you know very well, you're wearing it, it's made of oil, it's very elastic. And carbon fiber, it's lighter, stronger, used for rockets and uh, aircraft bodies, very strong. Uh, very promising material in today's world. And uh, we have a weight in between. And what's surprising is that a carbon fiber is the first to be severed here. Polyester, it will extend. Uh, and therefore, the power is uh, uh, divided into three points. Uh, but you can see that the spider silk is the strongest and most uh, elastic. So can we use this in today's world? That is what we are doing in our uh, spin-off called Spiber. And uh, our juniors are really working hard. And uh, they are they have succeeded in doing this with the microbial fermentation. Uh, with the spiders, uh, they do have genes uh, to create the uh, spider silk, and uh, this genes uh, could be planted uh, on to the microbes, so as to create this synthetic spider silk to be generate into fibers. In terms of uh, uh, toughness, uh, we do have the toughness that excels the natural uh, spider silk. And it's, since it is uh, made of uh, uh, protein, uh, we can get sheets, films, and gels as well. Uh, this is uh, like having the protein-derived plastics. I was uh, I wanted to show you the video, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. Uh, and uh, they are collaborating with North Face uh, to come up with this parka. And in collaboration with uh, Lexus, uh, this was exhibited at Paris Motor Show last year. Great uh, uh, seat back. Uh, it can absorb the shock, and yet it is tough. So, prototyping has already begun, and uh, very excellent design as well, elaborate design. And my necktie, uh, this is made from spider silk as well. So it's not just uh, these uh, uh, cool uh, gadgets, uh, but some uh, daily, more mundane stuff created from spider silk as well. Now, we are simulating the natural spider silk to be created by microbes. But for further development of mankind, we have to be able to design this. That's, that will be a great solution. When we look at spiders with single spider, they are actually generating different types 
types of uh, silk. Uh, for example, this particular species can create seven different types of uh, silk. Uh, on the top is the structural silk. Uh, this is the kind of uh, silk uh, that Spider-Man will use to jump from one building to another uh, using uh, the mallets. Uh, it's very tough. Uh, so uh, on the y-axis, uh, in the uh, tensile uh, stress, uh, it's very strong. And uh, for a spiral, uh, for catching the prey, it has to be able to absorb the shock, and therefore you have to have uh, the elasticity. And uh, you need uh, the silk for swathing uh, silk, the soft inner silk for egg sac. So from elastic ones to the strong ones, it has a very wide range of properties. But it all comes from single origin. Uh, it was 360 million years ago uh, that spiders uh, were generated. And at that time, a spider could create only one type of silk, but then it evolved, which means that we can trace back. Uh, they are 45,000 different species of uh, a spider today, uh, but we can uh, look at them all and uh, backtrack uh, this uh, division uh, and see uh, how the physical properties have been changed uh, over uh, the centuries. Uh, and uh, by sequencing this, uh, by analyzing this, uh, we can design the uh, type of silk that has the desired uh, property. Now, we have to charge for this, and big numbers always count. So we're talking about 1,000 spiders to be sampled in 3.5 years. But this is a very close to mission impossible. There are various hurdles that need to be cleared. First is the genomes, spider genomes. As Chris said, uh, the sequencing cost is uh, coming down, $1,000 for human genomes. That is done because you already have the human genomes that could be used as reference. Whereas uh, when you want to start from scratch, it's still costly. And uh, to have 1,000 genomes to be sequenced, that could be quite costly. Uh, but uh, these are the kind of things that can be resolved by trying hard. What's mission impossible is that the spider genome is unique in that the gene is about 10 times longer and it has the repeated uh, uh, sequence. And uh, before, in the prior sequencers, they could only look at the shorter portion. So if there are so many repeats, uh, we cannot uh, assemble them, even with computers. When you have so many repeats, uh, you cannot recreate in long DNA. Uh, so human genomes can be sequenced, but uh, when it comes to the spider genomes, we only have 11 of them that have been elucidated. So that was considered to be mission impossible. But, well, this is the actual spy drawing. You can see so many repeats, A, A, G, 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 Q, Q, so many of them with slight difference. And that slight difference uh, would be the key in elucidating the physical property. So what to do about this? This is a self-alignment. Then came the solution, the nanopore sequencer which is really helping us. Uh, the beauty of nanopore sequencer is that the uh, DNA could be sequenced at this original length almost. Uh, about uh, 50,000 uh, bases uh, can be read. And uh, this uh, repeated and the spider silk portion can be sequenced as well. And RNA could be sequenced as well. So we can look at the direct RNA long read. And uh, there are some uh, accuracy problems uh, which could be supplemented with the conventional sequencer. And with this, we have been able to get a complete sequence of this spider. 
DNA. I said seven different uh, genes. Uh, it's actually eight uh, for this particular species because it has two uh, genes for the spider silk. Now, we are also looking at the mechanical properties, the thermal, uh, water resistance, uh, and uh, uh, crystalline aspects as well. And through the machine learning, uh, we can leverage that. Uh, we can come up uh, with someone, something that is uh, highly resistant to heat, uh, water, etc. We have 1,000 uh, different sequences uh, that have uh, all but been completed. So the materials that we have today, this is the landscape today, and that's going to change dramatically. Steel, carbon fiber, very strong, nylon, rubber, very plastic. So far, we only have covered these very specific areas, but uh, some of the protein materials are already been used. The silkworm silk, the protein material, which is known to humans for a long time, and this is where Japan excels. And uh, some of the strong ones do compare to steel, steel, not enough to cover this wide area in between. But uh, when we apply this 1,000 data points that we have gathered, this is how it looks. From very strong areas to very elastic area, we have been able to cover uh, the uh, mechanical properties that can cover almost all of the areas. And we do have the data on all those. And through the machine learning, we are trying to do further analysis. Uh, and uh, the materials that are uh, strong enough to compare to aramid fiber or things that would be elastic to compare rubber, those are important. But what's important is something in the left up lower left hand corner. How this has evolved into others to follow that evolution path is really important for our design purposes. I can't give you the details because they are patented, but we already know uh, what portion needs to be modified to change some of the properties. For example, uh, tarantula, uh, those uh, very rudimentary ones uh, would not have the webs. Uh, they would uh, move around on the ground. And uh, we do have some motifs. And we see the correlation. And for each of the property, uh, we do have the quantitative data and trying to map to see the difference. But what we are analyzing are not just the spider silks. Uh, we are analyzing uh, the uh, proteins uh, from uh, the uh, bagworm moth or uh, crickets as well. Why bagworm moth? Because uh, one uh, literature showed uh, that uh, bagworm moth is stronger. This is that literature I'm talking about, uh, this uh, uh, comic. This is a manga. Uh, uh, terraforma, uh, and uh, this is the uh, key person uh, that is using the bagworm moth uh, with the assumption that its silk is stronger than spider silk. Uh, but uh, we uh, looked into this and we found that the spider silk is actually stronger uh, to our great relief. Now, I said toughness is important, but sometimes only strength is needed. For example, uh, for the framework uh, for this table, it doesn't have to be extensible. You only need strength. And it's better not to uh, extend. Or you might want something that would extend, not the strength. And when you look around, there are such materials. For example, our teeth protein and calcium made very strong like ceramic it does 
as an extent, but very strong, uh, like the ivory uh, and the beak of a giant squid. No uh, calcium, almost no uh, uh, calcium, almost protein, which means that it can be synthesized easily. And uh, Pyrrhic uh, is a seven meter fish uh, and a scale. Uh, of uh, that uh, uh, f uh, fish uh, could be used as the shoehorn. Uh, this is the fish that lives uh, in Amazon. Uh, it's very strong, could be used as a shoehorn. Uh, and uh, uh, resonin uh, is a protein uh, from flea. Uh, you, uh, you already know that when flea uh, is enlarged to the size of a human, uh, it can leap over a Tokyo Tower. Uh, and that leap force comes from uh, this resilient uh, protein. Uh, there are 1.7 million species uh, in the world, and uh, we can learn from these species, and they are regenerative. And therefore, we are looking into all those different materials. And I'm getting close to the end. So the spider object. I think you're going to have a new perspective when looking at this object the next time. So the merger between organic and inorganic. So the future uh, of uh, the urban cities is something that can come from uh, something very organic like spiders. Very good talk, thank you. Uh, and again, we'll have uh, some Q&A at the end. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Sebastian Kochoba to uh, also present the last uh, talk, which will get into some more, more interesting things you can discover uh, from plants and other genomes, as well as a little bit of nanopore sequence. No, no, no. Come on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. So, uh, my name is Sebastian, and uh, I'd like to talk to you today about the idea of doing science as a hobby. And um, this was around the uh, early 1800s when things were happening in terms of gentleman science, where a bunch of rich nobles. Uh, would come together and talk about the natural world. And in doing so, kind of formulated the process of understanding the natural world uh, through empirical experiments. And what I'd like to propose is the ability, is the fact that we can now do it in the comfort of our own homes. And we can also do it um, at a very early age. So trying to be able to convince um, education bodies to be able to uh, tap into the resources of young minds to allow them to do research that would otherwise not be grantable or pursuable through formal academic means. So, first a little introduction. So, uh, I'm one of a three-member team uh, known as Binomica Labs. We're a small nonprofit company uh, based in New York City, and uh, we develop educational curriculum for students of all ages that are open-ended, meaning that it doesn't terminate in a final experiment where you learn a technique but it was only new to you. Well, we've known this technique for many, many, many years. Uh, the core of this idea is to actually take the questions that have yet to be answered, small questions, like small kid, small question, big kid, big question, um, and in doing so, teach them critical thinking skills so they can get to the point where they can answer questions that contribute meaningfully to the scientific conversation, regardless of the fact that they might be 10 years old. Um, at the same time, I'm also a biohacker. Now, how many of you have heard this term before, biohacker? Okay. Oh, good. So uh, this is a family portrait of uh, a lot of the biohackers on planet Earth coming together at the MIT Media Lab to discuss some of their work. And uh, there's people from the entire range of the socioeconomic spectrum, as well as uh, academic accolades, from tenured professors to retired plumbers to children, uh, people of all ages, enthusiastic about science and applying it into a hobby. So uh, a little story about me. Uh, so these are plants, and I love plants. 
Uh, I've been obsessed with these since I was about yay tall. I would uh, look at them, feel them, touch them, put them in my mouth. I'm surprised they've survived this long. Some of the plants I later learned that were very toxic. Um, but the, the main thing that captivated me was actually the pattern of these things, right? How, how does life form these? Now, is anyone familiar with this plant in particular? Any chance? So this is the Romanesco broccoli, and it follows a Fibonacci spiral, the golden ratio. And uh, this is a common mathematical principle, and we can also see it in nature. Uh, I've seen these in grocery stores, and when I was little, I would always ask, how, how is that possible? What, what are the things that, that are involved? And I would ask my teachers, I would ask my parents, and no one really knew the answer, uh, which frustrated me a little bit. Uh, the next thing I was obsessed with is structure. This is General Sherman. It's an 83-meter-tall sequoia in California, and it takes about 40 people to hug it all the way around. Now, the, the most fascinating part about this is that it moves tons of water up and down the trunk of its tree each day for free. The energy expenditure is near zero because it goes through capillary force. So by not expending any energy and utilizing the material properties on a nanoscale, you can move a ma massive amount of mass without expending energy. This is incredibly important for future cities to utilize this type of technology. Uh, the last and most important thing that I'm fascinated with are these things. These are flowers. Right, the reproductive organs of plants. The, um, I was fascinated by the color, the iridescence, all of these type of structures that are formed. Uh, and again, my questions were, how do these things come about? Right? I didn't know we had the ability to edit them, but I was just curious as to how. Uh, and eventually, my frustration led to taking matters into my own hands. So I slowly saved up my money, and I bought my first microscope. Uh, and uh, this was one of my early slides. I did a gram stain at the age of seven, which was pretty cool. Um, and I used some of the stains to elucidate the actual structures. Now, on the microscopic scale, a lot of these colors are lost, so I used a dye that stains these cells. And for the first time ever, I saw cells, not in a textbook, but right in front of me. So I saw the cell theory of life, those units of life. And that blew my mind. Um, that eventually led to an obsession that led to an addiction to the concept of doing science by myself, doing science at home. Fast forward to today, and this is the third bedroom of my mother's apartment, my personal lab. Uh, it has everything necessary to do biology, including genetic engineering. Uh, now, with the thanks to Nanopore, I can do sequencing, genetic assembly, and uh, all for the modification and understanding of plants. So I do basic formal research in my bedroom. Here are some of the chemicals that I use. These are all the building blocks of life, distributed into powders and metals and salts, uh, so they can better understand what is food for these organisms. So I'm more of a generalist, and I like to study the larger picture. And in doing so, I have to understand how these organisms exist. What are they made of? Well, what, are, what do their sequences tell us? And because I'm obsessed with plants, uh, these are some examples of tissue culture. So I do, uh, you can regenerate a whole plant from a single cell, and in doing so, hack it to add genes that you would like. And I'll explain how to do this in a sec. Um, but because I don't uh, take government grants, I can grow my lab however I'd like. So I have wild plants growing. Uh, my dog comes in, I got him a nice little lab coat, so he hangs out with me. Uh, but more importantly, this is my little, as Carl Sagan put it, uh, spaceship of the imagination. This is where I pursue these, these academic questions from the comfort of my home. So I wouldn't be able to do any of this without tools. So I'm going to exp explain a couple of the fundamental tools that allow me to do genetic engineering. First up is this. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this in trees. This is called crown gall disease, and it's caused by a bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And uh, scientists in the 60s were uh, asked to figure out how this disease forms. We knew that a bacteria was causing it, but we didn't know the exact mechanism. Some people were thinking that it was hormones that were being expressed, um, that caused it topically to change the genetic, um, to change the cellular signaling of the plant. But later we realized that these plants actually do genetic engineering. They've been doing it since before we were monkeys. So here's an example of Agrobacterium in action. Um, the green is the plant cell, and the orange and red is the bacteria. Now, this is a common soil bacteria that sits in the ground and does its soil bacteria thing and lives its life. Um, but if it smells plant blood, these polyphenols, it acts like a shark in the water, and it starts going to almost near suicide to produce this little packet of information, stab a straw, essentially, into the wounded plant cell, and inject this genetic payload. And that yellow portion over there 
is a nuclear targeting protein that guides this genetic payload into the nucleus where the DNA gets expressed. So it can essentially take genes that cause for food and shelter that only it can utilize and hack the plant to produce this massive structure. So inside this gall are billions and billions of bacteria happily existing in a parasitic state with this organism. Uh, after figuring this, this incredible discovery out, we've now decided to replace the tumor-causing genes with whatever we would like. So now, instead of causing massive tumors on trees, it can start trans transforming the plant to express important biomolecules, like human insulin, or high-value molecules like astaxanthin, which is $30,000 a kilogram. Um, and all of these can be done with plants hacking this organism. Uh, the next device is this. So this is my home gene gun. So it's the JG-1000. I bought it as a knockoff from China. And for the cost of about $3,000, you can circumvent 90% of all the laws that regulate genetic engineering by removing this organism, the agrobacterium, from the equation. This essentially acts like a genetic shotgun. You attach DNA to, the, to these microparticles of tungsten, and it shoots it into the cell. Now, the center of the leaf would get destroyed, but the corona around that shot, like a shotgun, um, is just enough in velocity to keep the cells alive, but transfer the DNA into the plant. Now, the last part is this. So this r recent discovery and utilization is called CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so over here, we see the Cas9 uh, riboprotein complex. The purple is a piece of RNA that essentially acts like a sock to a, ha a hunting dog. You give it a scent, either like a bit of fox urine or things like that, and it gets, gets the identity of what you're targeting, and it runs into the nucleus, targets that region, and cuts it. Right? So it essentially acts like a homing, um, a homing missile that goes in and cuts it with precision. Now, like I said before, agrobacterium inserts this DNA into the nucleus, but it inserts it randomly, so we can't control exactly where. So if we're targeting an integration of a gene in a specific place, doing agrobacterium would require thousands of plants, and you screen for the right localization, which is a matter of chance. Now, with CRISPR-Cas9, we can target that exact, the exact gene and put it in the right place. And here's an example of the pipeline of going from having the, the riboprotein complex Exp uh, add the DNA that encodes these things into a plasmid. The plasmid gets transferred, bits of the plasmid gets transferred into the plant via agrobacterium. The protein gets expressed inside the plant, it binds with the RNA, and it starts targeting the DNA you would like. So now you have this machine that can perpetually target that gene of interest and essentially delete it, if you'd like, or add parts. So this allows for precision engineering. Okay. And here are some applications done with these type of technologies. So first, commercial. Um, to the left, the top and bottom images is of alfalfa. It's the alfalfa weevil, and it can devastate uh, crops of alfalfa. It's a common, common uh, food crop. Now, on top is natural alfalfa, on the bottom is, is Bt toxin-expressing alfalfa. Um, it's a gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is an ancient bacteria the Egyptians used to grow in compost to throw over their corn, or, I mean, over their crop, uh, mostly wheat. And uh, in doing so, the bacteria produces a protein that damages insects. We decided to skip the, the uh, uh, bacteria altogether and then put it directly into the plant. So the weevil at the top uh, naturally is just eating away at the wild-type bacteria. The weevil at the bottom takes one bite and dies. This is a natural pesticide in doing so. Um, on the top, the three rice is golden rice. I'm sure you've all have heard about this. If not, it's rice that expresses vitamin A and E, specifically beta-carotene. And golden rice one was the first iteration. Golden rice two, the more yellow, the more vitamin A. So it's a significant increase. Um, about 20-something million people die every year due to uh, vitamin A and E uh, malnutrition and deficit. So this is a humanitarian effort to try to tackle that difficulty. Right here at the bottom is the thing called an arctic apple. It's an apple that doesn't brown. Uh, in the United States, they did a poll, and they saw that uh, middle school students would not eat apples that are brown. So during their cafeteria food, uh, while they were eating it, they would skip the ones that are brown, thus decreasing their nutritional intake. So they decided to delete one gene, uh, deactivate one gene, and by doing so, it removed the browning altogether. And now you can buy it. It's from a company known as Intrexon. And uh, they're going to hit the market in the United States in about a couple months. And they're the golden delicious. I've tried these personally. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, the last one over here is the Glowing Plant Kickstarter project. If, um, 
If you haven't heard about it, it was the idea of taking the genes of fireflies and putting them into a plant. Um, this caused a lot of controversy, which I won't really get into, but the idea is that this was one of the first examples of a small business uh, designer plant, which is kind of the topic of what I'd like to uh, explain today. So now that I've covered corporate projects, I'd like to talk a little bit about my personal projects, things that I've worked on. So the first one is the beefsteak tomato. Now, um, there's a huge issue with protein in plants. In that there's not much protein per gram of plant. So we decided to take the genes from a cow, uh, specifically myoglobin, the, the blood that comes out of meat when you cook it, and express it in a tomato, making a literal beef steak tomato. Um, and uh, this was an art project to touch on the idea of what is vegan, what is not. I mean, the only thing I took from this animal, uh, from a cow, is information. So it's an animal product expressed in a plant, but I've never touched or harmed an animal in doing so. Um, so it plays on the idea of what is, um, what is vegan, what is the future of food, how do we engineer it, um, but mostly just for, as an art project. Next one, oh, here's an example of the actual world's first myo tomato. And we're doing analysis on it. Uh, DNA came back positive, so we have the gene expressed. Uh, we have the gene present. We're going to see in terms of expression very soon and make more and more concentrated versions of this, or this uh, plant. Uh, because we're artists uh, at the School of Visual Arts, we decided to take it one step further and do uh, product, product branding. So here is Mayo's tomato soup, or Mayo tomato ketchup. We've taken the no known brands of uh, American foods and labeled it with our product, speculating the future of protein-based foods. Okay, uh, the next one is blue plants. Let's see if that plays. Um, so if you're not familiar, Suntory um, decided to make the world's first blue rose and uh, it's called the applause. And to many people, they were a little bit disappointed because they saw that it was purple, not blue. Right? So I decided to take a stab at that project, and I started thinking, instead of going the chemical route, which is complex and involves many genes, why not focus on the protein route? And there are these things called chromoproteins, like the ones seen here in the center. They're, they came from a tropical clam, that one right there. It's actually just called the tropical clam, very boring name. Um, take those genes and express it into a white rose. Very simple, straightforward ability. And what I have today is this. So I've engineered this entirely synthetic uh, protein that's blue. That's not um, a hue done by chemicals, it's done by protein. It's a single gene, and you can express it uh, in bacteria very well. The next step will be to express it in plants. Uh, slightly more controversial. Um, not this one, the next one's going to be controversial. This one's more magical. So, have you seen the, uh, the story of Dr. Seuss called the Lorax, by any chance? Um, so, it's um, a story about this, this animal who's trying to protect, protect these magical trees called the truffula tree. Now, this is a, a fairy tale or work of fiction that's told to children in the United States and abroad. Um, and what I'd like to do is make this a reality. So I took a trip to Australia, and uh, along my journeys, I found this organism called the Australian grass plant. And it kind of looks like a truffula tree. Now, if we make it haploid, the leaves get thinner, meaning that if you cut the, DNA, the chromosome count in half, chemically, the, D the leaves get thinner. If you express a red chromoprotein, the leaves now turn pink. So slowly but surely, we can actually make this organism come to life. So it's one action of fairy tales coming to life. Um, a slightly more controversial project is this. So this is the apple that, that put Snow White to sleep. So the goal of this project is to take uh, a common sleeping aid, melatonin, and overexpress it to an almost lethal level in an apple. So one bite might make you drowsy, two bites you might be in a coma, three bites you might die. Um, and the goal behind this is to have this, this dangerous apple from fairy tales and put it under a glass jar. Right, and say that it's not only the positive things that we can make, but the, the, the acts of villainy that can also be highlighted in fairy tales. So be giving the whole picture, not just the good but the bad, as a way to show the social aspects of what you can do with genetic engineering, both positive and negative, because we need that conversation to happen. Okay, so the next section is exploration. So one of my favorite quotes, which I'm trying to figure out who said, is, we are the middle children of history, born too late to explore the Earth, born too early to explore space. Um, I think that's categorically false. So, we are not born too late to explore the Earth. For example, here's the 8.7 million eukaryotes that exist on this planet, 
And according to a Nature paper in, published in 2015, I believe, 80% um, of them have yet to be discovered. There's an enormous amount left to be discovered. And a lot of these organisms are not financially or academically incentivized to be studied. Um, a very depressing number for me personally is that out of all the plants that have been sequenced, only 137 have been fully sequenced. Out of the 3.3 million known land plants, three, 137, a literal drop in the ocean. And in the year 2017, as, as scientists and as humans, um, this is a bit embarrassing. So I'm going to propose some ideas about this. Uh, as Dr. Mason said, um, the cost of sequencing is dropping, and it's dropping so, uh, so dramatically that someone like me, in the third bedroom of my mom's apartment, can own a genetic sequencer. These were normally relegated to the uh, halls of academia, and now you can have it in the comfort of your own home. So uh, I decided to take this plant, Oxalis stricta, um, a, a weed that's cosmopolitan, it exists everywhere. In fact, I'm going to see if I can take some samples around Tokyo as well. And uh, basically, when people ask me, why sequence this? It's unknown, nobody really cares, why sequence it? I said, uh, because it has heart-shaped leaves, and I think it's beautiful. And that should be enough, honestly. Right? This is purely out of curiosity. So I said, why not? Contribute to science and have an idea that's driven purely by your own pleasure, because at the end of the day, this is a hobby. So, uh, this is me and my research buddy in our pajamas doing sequencing at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so this was the world's first uh, plant genome sequenced at home. We're currently going f much further into this. We're going to um, use other technologies as well, collaborate with Dr. Mason uh, to further the sequencing effort and have a a foundational platform so that other people can take up what we've done and utilize it to another organism that they find beautiful, not necessarily for financial or corporate gain. Okay, the next section is education. Now, this one is really, really near and dear to my heart, because like I said at the beginning of this talk, uh, the, the reason why I'm here today was actually out of frustration, that I couldn't figure out the answers to my questions. And when I tried to Google some of the questions, uh, I found out that we still don't know these answers. But science is not magic, it's a tool, it's a way of thinking, as uh, uh, Richard Feynman said. So how can we bridge the gap between education and research so that the students who have these questions can seek the answers themselves? Well, typically, this is a, a chemistry class in a middle school in America. Uh, they're doing an experiment that has been done for 70 years plus, and everybody in academia knows the answer to it, but these three kids. So they're learning an, an ability, they're learning a skill by answering a question that's been answered a billion times. Now, what if we, we posit the idea that we give these students small, open-ended questions that no one will have the time to answer, no one will have the incentive to answer, but we give them direct academic attribution? So as a nonprofit, we can generate DOI numbers, digital object identifiers, the same numbers that are given to publications on the internet uh, for scientific research. And we can give the students discoveries in sequencing, in um, understanding metabolics, in any of these small questions, um, credit, so that by the time they go to high school or college, they have two publications under their belt. That's more valuable than any test in the grand scheme of things, because this teaches critical thinking. So as, a, as an experiment, I uh, met this young lady, uh, Bianca Lewis, I met her at a hacker conference, and she told me she has a science fair. Um, and I said, instead of doing a generic science fair, can we do research together, real research? Um, so at the, at the hacker convention, I was doing some tissue culture, and near that, near that table was my favorite plant, Oxalis, the one that I'm sequencing. And she came up to me and she asked, what, what is this? What is this plant? And I said, um, not too many people know about it. It's common, uh, but the knowledge is lacking. And she said, oh, it looks really green. What do you feed it? And I said, that's your question, right? What do you feed this plant? If you don't know anything about it, how do you gather the information necessary to keep it alive? So we embarked on an adventure. And um, through her question, I guided her by digesting the more jargon-heavy content of academic literature to the reading level of a 10-year-old, and then a little bit further to the reading level of a 12-year-old, trying to challenge her a little further each time. And the result of this was this. So uh, she did a science fair project on figuring out the recipe required to keep Oxalis stricta alive in a greenhouse condition, um, also in vitro. This exact information is what I'm using now, her exact data, to further my studies in this, and we're actually going to co-publish a paper in BioArchive in a few months on the data that she generated. She's going to be first author, and she'll be 10 years old. 
So this is pushing a boundary as to who can do science and who, um, how small of a question is still valuable. And the answer is any question is valuable as long as it contributes information. So the next part is design. So my fascination with plants, like I said, culminated in flower design. Right? Now this is, the, uh, this is one of the flowers that I'm interested in because as opposed to any other kind of flower in the daisy family, these have pinched petals and it's genetically inherited. So that means there are genes responsible for these types of pinched petals. Now, we've started to further our understanding of these morphologies to the point where the flower on the top, on the left over there, is the wild-type flower. On the bottom is by adding a single gene that now spreads the amount of petals by an inordinate ma magnitude to actually garner an understanding of the localization and quantification of the amount of petals, essentially designing a flower. One of the most interesting discoveries is here in Petunia, they've actually found that it's not... that if, if you see over there by the arrow how there's a darker purple, that's not a different chemical. That's actually a physical, structural difference in the way these cells arrange themselves, which can be controlled. So they have structural patterning, similar to a butterfly. These old things have been eluc uh, are being elucidated, and we're now getting a genetic tool set to understand and control the design of flowers. Here, for example, is a wonderful phenomenon called transposon effects. These transposons are small genetic elements that jump in and out of genes that cause... Um, it can cause all kinds of damage, but it can also cause visible anomalies. Like, for example, on the left is the galaxy Starry Night Petunia. Uh, those are done by the random integration of the transposon into the gene that encodes the pigmentation, the color of the flower. So by temporarily interrupting uh, the gene that codes the flower in those specific cells, you get these interesting patterns. Now, we're starting to slowly understand the mechanism of this. And for example, here in, in, in Morning Glory, you can actually see that with sequencing, we can figure out where these transposons are located, how long they are, uh, its identity, and more importantly, the expression. So we're getting very close to being able to pattern and control the structure. Now, take everything that I just told you about the idea that you can do science at home, that a 10-year-old can publish scientific data, um, that the tools of doing said science are becoming affordable. Now, imagine we give all of, these, all of these tools to children and allow their imaginations to take flight. Here is a book that, I've been in, that has been my source of inspiration for many years. This is The Codex by Luigi Serafini. Um, it's a massive tome that's written in a language that doesn't exist, and, it's, and many chapters depict plants that make no sense. It, they almost can't exist. But these types of creativities, some of these might actually be biologically possible. Now, imagine how empowering it would be that a kid learning science is actually doing so by designing flowers, by, di by taking ideas like, I want it to be pink and smell like bubble gum and be as tall as me and it grows with my speed. Um, having all of these traits and mixing it together, you allow a, a maker-based educational system. Now, imagine having a, a modern city where all the flowers are designed by the children of that city. Keep that one in mind. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to invite the speakers up uh, to a quick panel for about 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll also uh, we'll do a quick discussion, but also encourage any questions from the audience if, if people have uh, some thoughts. Like that. Um, so it, it seems like now we can um, design or detect or, or modify almost any organism. Uh, I, I might start first, I guess, with spiders in terms of, uh, you mentioned moths uh, as another potential organism. Yes. Are there other insects we should consider for uh, other lessons we could learn? Well, there are so many different kinds of insects that produce fibers, and there are also fish that actually makes fibers uh, that uh, in, in the water, they uh, use it as a web trap to uh, catch some other insects and something else. So, actually, any kinds of um, living organism on Earth is producing some kind of structural proteins that we can uh, produce to uh, use for the, uh, our society. Yes, oh, which is great. And then even in plants, I'm sure there's lessons uh, of other plants that might um, reveal structural properties yep. or, or other things. You, if you had a wish list of, of oh. things in plants. 
that you'd want to bring into uh, uh, other um, places. Yeah. The uh, the control of vines for structural structural purposes. Imagine you can grow a house by just having vines that track in only one direction, and you plant them in a specific way so that a hut can form at the speed of bamboo in like two weeks. Right? Those kind of concepts. Um, yeah, structurally, it's it seems to be essentially the holy grail. Imagine an architect being able to grow a building. Right? If you can get a sequoia to 83 meters, why not add a couple rooms? Right? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, for the nanopore sequencing uh, and the device, it, it uh, was a good summary of the state of the technology in the field. And I once was emailing uh, with Gordon and Clive uh, about getting nanopores all the way to Mars. We know that they can last for seven months, but do you think uh, there's been some discussion of solid state pores or having pores last all the way to detect life maybe on other planets or, or even to see uh, traces of life. Um, how, how long do you think they could last, I guess? Or how far could they go? We are that, that, that type of question we receive a lot from our customer and the development team is working so hard. And they're not just the device and the flows of consumables, reagent have to accommodate with that situation. And uh, I'm sure you will hear good news very soon. Good, good, yes. good. good. <laughs> Um, unless if anyone wants to make other comments, if, if so, one thing I can do is um, my another research topic is on tardigrades, and uh, yeah. tardigrades are water bears uh, which can dry up completely when the environment dries out, and all the proteins are there to protect all the other uh, proteins and also the membranes and all the cell structures. And if we can produce a tardigrade uh, protein-based lyophilized, uh, probably the membranes of the uh, nanopores, we can probably ship the uh, nanopores dry which can be kept for many months, right, right, many like years, that. too. Uh, yeah, and uh, Dynococcus radiodurans also yes. is pretty t tough in that way. So it's, um, yeah, so with lessons we can learn from those species. They yes. can also survive outside the space station, mm -hmm. like a Bacillus pumilus can as well. So yes. uh, this came up uh, yesterday in the form of, of learning from uh, the, the water bear to, mm -hmm. to, to live in space. So. Yes, the endurance to radiation is also a very important topic if you do the interplanetary shipping and other uh, devices yeah. and also, uh, also the astronauts. You mentioned the genetic modification of the astronauts themselves mm -hmm. to survive the interplanetary ship which i think we might have to do or i tried to make the the ethical argument that we we have, might be bound to uh, by ethics that be, because otherwise if you send a human all the way to mars and and you just kind of say uh you know good luck and hopefully you don't die uh <laughs> you know which is which is mean which is is cruel and i think unethical you should actually say we have defended uh, you mechanically, we've defended you electromagnetically, and if we can, we will defend you genetically. Uh, I, I think it's uh, what we should do. But of course, it has uh, big implications because if you modify the human genome at the germline level, that you you can't. Uh, it's not easy to go back. But one good thing of modified humans, if they're sent to another planet, they're already quarantined on a totally different planet. So um, if something goes really wrong we know that they're uh, on another planet. <laughs> There's one built-in quarantine policy. Uh, and that, that's actually good to, to the risk, some of the risk questions uh, Sebastian brought up. Uh, you know, I think it's great to have the discussion of, of the very exciting things you can do, but also what can go wrong and what else uh, are, are you, is the panel worried about or, uh, you know, obviously super bugs or uh, you know, weaponizing bacteria, that's kind of obvious, but what else? Are you, are you? Um, for me, it, it might be... Uh, a different take on it, but I'm actually worried about the lack of, of adoption of these type of technologies. Mm. Because if, uh, I'm sure you've all seen the movie Interstellar, that was, the, the space part is not necessarily important. The part is, it's a story of a farmer's love for his daughter mm. and what he'll do to get there. And the main, the main concept of that, of that movie, of that story, is that we've, got, we've experienced a blight, a plant disease, that was so devastating that we had to find a wormhole and go to a different galaxy to escape it, right? The, the, the big worry here is that we might get to these type of massive uh, epidemic levels of disease for plants, and we're not fast enough in our research processes, yeah. right? So sometimes being too afraid is a bad thing. Like in the movie, there was a scene where they said, uh, there's no time for caution. Uh, I don't want us to ever get to that point where we have to rush. So right now, with education, we might be able to uh, skew the odds in favor of careful adoption of new technologies and increasing the amount of researchers working on these things before it's too late. Yeah, that's great. Not to be like terrifying anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. And any other worries or concerns or... Uh, 
So in terms of the um, understanding of the genomics, we always say decoding the genome, but what we are actually doing is only writing out what the ADJC codes are, and we are not really sure the quantitative effects of the each modification of the base. So in terms of the genetic modification of the spider silks, we do not have any idea not right now uh, what happens if we change one amino acid and what quantitatively changes the uh, structural properties of silks. So we really have to have much more understanding of the actual genetics of the, each of the single nucleotide, uh, as in the case of the, the, the uh, disease in humans, yeah. but more quantitatively, not qualitatively. Um, so, drilling session, I was, it was, I'm so impressed with the, the, in the beginning of their research, all just a very small curiosity. Mm -hmm. Their very main idea is, I'm interested in, I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really important. It doesn't really matter okay, how much money you can get and what is the outcome, mm -hmm. but it's really important to keep your motivation and, you know, just, that is something, I was talking to Sebastian, you know, it's, it's difficult to teach, educate, mm -hmm. so, Listen your own heart and uh, what you're interested in that comes from your internal inside of you and uh, doing some research, doing some science. You don't really need to think something, doing huge thing, just uh, one step ahead. So in education and your kids, uh, giving them some kind of opportunity, some device, uh, more something getting close to the science because science happening uh, every day, every life around, around your life. So that's something uh, I really That's great. Yeah, good, good example with the the ten year old uh, being the first <laughs> author. Yeah. And I, um, I might uh, I have two questions to the audience before I will open it up to questions. And the the first question might be. Uh, 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 who, who wants a nanopore sequencer? Do people want one nanopore? <laughs> if it was free, if it was oh. just giving, I think okay, that's good. Uh, and then the second is, who wants uh, a tie made of spider silk? Anybody want one of those? <laughs> yeah. Okay, you've got some customers. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. uh, and then who wants uh, gen mo genetically tailored flowers that, that would be made by Sebastian? Would you like some for your house? Uh, okay, good. You might have more clients. Good. Um, so I, 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 yeah. um, so uh, I want to open it up. If anyone has questions uh, for anyone on the panel about any of the science or technology you've heard today. Uh, we have uh, f five or ten minutes just for some questions, so uh, feel free to ask. Uh, how many people want to go to Mars? Anybody want to go to Mars? <laughs> well, not as many, no. It's it's prettier here. Yeah. Is it a return flight? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a one-way trip. <laughs> one <laughs> good, good question. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for the great presentation. It was really great to hear it. So thanks also for Sebastian for blogging the Bio Summit. It was really a great meeting, and I was so happy to have your workshop there as well. And George Church hang out with us, and it was <laughs> super amazing. Yeah. Um, I really liked that you that you kind of also uh, were mentioning the kind of the. Um, the fears or the concerns, the possibles. And we really would like to go a little bit more into this because, of course, here this is Mori, we are all techno utopists, you know, mm -hmm. we kind of believe in the good futures. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm from Europe, from Austria originally, and if you just say the word GMO, you know, yeah. everybody <laughs> will run away, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think, how's the, your experience in, in Japan? How's it in the US? Is this like nudging slowly, or what can we do to accept a p potential better futures? So. Uh, personally, I think that the um, well, we, we never want to accept anything blindly, right? It, we don't want to believe in science. We don't want scientism. We want to be skeptical. Um, but teaching the ability to find truth from false and the ability to think critically, I think, is the first stepping stone into realizing whether a technology is beneficial or that the, the benefit outweighs the risk. Because if somebody says that um, GMOs cause cancer, it's, it's harder to refute that than it is to believe that because it's immediately dangerous for us to be wrong in that sense. So we don't want to actually, um, whenever somebody believes these things, it's difficult to change their idea. Uh, there's an old joke saying, how many psychologists does it need to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb needs to want to change, right? So it's the same concept. You don't want to force feed anybody this information, but educating them on the facts, because you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So the things that we can say is true, with high certainty, um, we should be teaching at an early age. And by doing so, they can make their own decisions, because there could be a company that comes up with a very bad idea, right? That's just categorically bad. How do we discern that from the hype? 
you know, of places like Silicon Valley that gets everything excited, right? How do we break that hype? And a lot of that has to do with education. So, yeah. In, in Japan, how is it? Uh, GMOs and genetic mode? So I think it's mostly uh, connected to the food issue because people are mostly afraid of food, what, what we eat. And GM is also used in many bacteria. And for example, insulin is currently mostly produced by uh, E. coli, I think. Mm -hmm. So it, that kind of uh, genetic modification using the bacteria isn't really much feared uh, for the people, but it's mostly about the food. So things like uh, making GMO product to revegetate um, <coughs> deserts may be acceptable because it's a benefit. Uh, as Mr. said, is uh, overrides the uh, fear of the GMO. So, like in Japan, when you buy tofu, always say that it's not genetically uh, modified; uh, <laughs> it's regulated. You have to mention that. So that kind of advertisement we are exposed every day. The our fear, concern, getting more and more. But as Sebastian mentioned, we just need to learn more and uh, understand why this advertisement, uh, that, why this is said so. So that knowing more about genomics and then not just trying to ban and scare, more like a how to utilize it. It may be something happening very, you know, the unexpected things, but uh, as long as we understand the accurately and uh, working with researchers and uh, not like uh, believing the company from their, I mean, own agenda, you know, the kind of information might be not, might be biased. Need to understand. Need to have the kind of mind because information is everywhere. You can get the internet. You can just hire someone writing bad and good. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand based on the fact and uh, try not to just avoiding it. Try to utilize it because technology is great. Technology has to be great things, not just making you scare. So understanding, working together, and living together, that makes a great future, I strongly believe. Yeah, I agree. It's great. Just one follow-up because I have it as well. So I'm actually also a university researcher, but I recently started a kind of biohacker space in Tokyo as well. Huh. Me, uh, Miyamoto san, would you be interested in collaborating with us and giving us some, uh, some minions? Sorry, you can answer later. <laughs> but yeah, we, we're trying to kind of also democratize science and kind of create a space where people can actually access labs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without yeah. having, of course, everybody wants to have in a bedroom, but yeah. <laughs> that's the next step. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, one, one day I was kind of thinking, oh, I want to have a lab in my kitchen. You know, there are lots of interesting, I want to know more about no, what soy sauce, you know. Mm. What in there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Any uh, any other questions or uh, uh, if no questions, um, I think we're right at the time. So I really want to thank the panel very much for coming, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to all the four speakers. Uh, a big round of applause, please.